Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 25 series, Can We Save the Oakland A's? And just want to start off by uh, thanking our loyal viewers for their patience over the past week. I am obviously back in the saddle now after a week without an episode. I uh, had a nice family vacation in Maine over the past week, so got to spend some quality time away from work and as it turns out also away from OOTP although I uh, did spend a lot of time thinking about and planning out what my next steps might be and I know that uh, many of our viewers have as well because we got a lot of uh, interesting comments to the last episode. As far as this one it's going to be uh, relatively short where it's uh, July 2nd 2032 and uh, we're just past the midway point of the season with a 38-44 and 44 record, 82 games into the year. And we're only going to sim nine games, or nine days more accurately, in this episode to get us to the draft. And then uh, we'll find out who's going to be available for us with the 22nd overall pick. And uh, hopefully have an opportunity for some of our loyal viewers in our worldwide scouting department to uh, opine on what we should do with that selection. Between now and then though, uh, we're going to be tapping the trade market and there's been a variety of opinions about what we should do this year. As I mentioned, at 38 and 44, we're actually last in the American League West this year. So those of you who are suggesting that we sell, I get where you're coming from, uh, but we have been unlucky this year, uh, 42 and 40, four games uh, better than our overall record is our Pythagorean record this year. Uh, we are a mediocre team as usual and run scored with 12th, or as often more accurately. And uh, we're fifth in the American League in runs allowed, so the pitching has been good, uh, but the starters ERA being 10th is a bit of an issue. But because we've, by at least one measure, gotten fairly unlucky over the first half of the season, and as we've talked about in previous episodes, this is a win-now team and kind of the last go-round for this core group that have been in the playoffs two of the last three years, winning the World Series in 2029. I'm inclined to be a buyer rather than a seller. Has been a suggestion to maybe move on from Colt Keith, uh, who's in the final year of his contract. He's going to be a free agent this upcoming offseason. And he's having with a 112 WRC plus the worst year of his career in Oakland. Both Gene C and James Miller Media suggested maybe moving on from Keith. If we play disastrously over the next three plus weeks, uh, that is something that I supposedly will have to consider. Although to be fair, uh, we're going to likely, if we don't sign Keith this upcoming off season will likely be getting a first round compensatory pick in return for him. So we will be getting something out of him even if we uh, don't trade him away. But given that offense has been our issue and he has been our best offensive player for the three plus years he's been on the team and is still a well above average offensive player this year, uh, moving on from Keith is going to be something that I think is only going to happen if we're 4-15 and 15 over our next 19 games or something like that. And another guy that uh, both Alkshi and Wyme943 suggested potentially moving on for him from is uh, Tyler Soderstrom. And this is one that I think is uh, a little more reasonable to consider even right now. Uh, Soderstrom, like Keith, is fragile physically. Uh, he's also on the wrong side of 30. But he has um, absolutely steadily deteriorated over the last three plus seasons. He won a shocking batting title in 2029 when we won the World Series. We had a league best 168 WRC plus, but that's deteriorated to a well above average offensive player in 2030, 
a slightly above average offensive player in 2031. And this year he's a below average offensive player. And given his uh, lack of fielding prowess, he's actually been below replacement level. We do still have him uh, with team options for the next couple of years, but at two and a half million, if he's basically a replacement level player, uh, that contract is not as uh, interesting as it was when he was uh, a much better player. Something that um, I'm also thinking about with Soderstrom is uh, that something that Noglegs brought up. Um, he was a little concerned about clubhouse morale, and Soderstrom at this point is one of two very unhappy players that we have. And it's really driven by his anger with his performance. Um, he's also unhappy that we're not playing well this year and unhappy with his role on the team. But um, we do have two very unhappy players on the team, Soderstrom being one of them. Uh, so if there's a way to maybe improve the clubhouse a bit, um, as Noglegs mentioned, uh, that's something that could push us to include Soderstrom in a trade as well. He doesn't have a massive amount of trade value at this point, as he did a few years ago when he was on a great contract and he was producing incredibly. But he's still definitely at the um, number he's at with the team options and with the fact that he does have a pretty well-established track record in the majors, and still on paper at least looks like a pretty effective offensive player against right-handed pitching, especially in terms of the home run power, there is some value there. And I mentioned that uh, Noglegs brought up um, concern about morale, and uh, it's actually not that bad. Team chemistry is still happy. Um, we do have a captain personality in Justin LeBron. Now he happens to only be playing against left-handed pitching, so he's not starting all that often, and he is actually um, unhappy, which is not ideal for our captain. Uh, he's very unhappy with his role on his team, playing um, starting only against lefties and then occasionally against righties. So it's certainly not ideal that our captain is um, unhappy. But we do have four other leaders on the team. We don't have any um, real negative personalities in the group. And when I look at overall morale, um, it's not bad. You can see we've got a bunch of people with great morale, a few very good, and then a lot of guys with good morale, as I alluded to. Um, Soderstrom and Chase DeLauder are both very unhappy. Um, that's almost entirely driven by their anger because they are playing like crap. Um, and then Andrew Nardi and Justin LeBron are both unhappy. Um, in Nardi's case, it's the team performance and his performance in LeBron's case as we talked about it's primarily his role on the team um, so we've got a few things we can fix up but overall we've got a lot more positive than negative going on in the clubhouse uh, despite the fact that it hasn't been a great season on the field for us thus yet and at the end of our last episode spent a little time highlighting at a high level, some of the options that are available on the trade block. And I've spent a lot more time offline looking at the trade block and then also just doing some player searches to see if perhaps there's someone who's not on the block that would be a realistic target for us. And unfortunately, big time pitchers, as expected, are going to be pretty expensive. For the most part, it is the... Uh, Texas Rangers, the team that is uh, barely ahead of us in the standings, that is shopping most of the pitchers. And there's a pretty interesting um, crew that's available. Uh, I'll talk about some of the less interesting guys at first. Um, And while four of these guys that we're going to talk about are on the Rangers, uh, there's one who's not, Aaron Ashby with the Red Sox, uh, left-handed veteran. Two and seven this year with a 4.05 ERA, uh, so not playing incredibly well. Uh, but he is a guy that 
the price is very low. Um, we can get Ashby for, you can see several dozen players in the organization will get us Ashby from the Red Sox. Um, I do kind of think with his lack of control that he is to some extent not necessarily a huge upgrade for us. Uh, we're getting a updated scouting report on him to hopefully get to very high scouting accuracy. If we have some injury issues over the next couple of weeks, um, I think about bringing him on board because the price is reasonable. But even though our starting rotation hasn't been as good as it has been in previous seasons this year, I don't see him as being more than a fourth or fifth starter for us. And I think I'd rather go for someone who's going to bring a little more bang for the buck to the organization. And similarly, one of the four Texas pitchers that's on the trade block, uh, Dominic Hamel, is another guy who the price for him in the trade market is very reasonable right now. You can see we've got tons of options to bring him on board. Um, he is, over the course of his major league career, a guy who's been slightly below average major leaguer in terms of his ERA plus and fit minus. Uh, seven and seven this year with a 4.24 ERA. Another guy that if we have some injury issues, we'd consider bringing him on board. Uh, doesn't throw incredibly hard, and he's also a fly ball pitcher um, who's right-handed, which hasn't particularly played incredibly in Oakland over the course of this playthrough. But I think with both Ashby and Hamill, uh, there's guys to think about um, down the line. Moving up um, in terms of the cost, Mike Burrows, 32-year-old uh, who's popular, which can always be helpful, uh, throws a little harder in the low to mid-90s. Uh, his stuff is not exceptional, but above average movement and control. Three-pitch arsenal, 6-5 six and five record, but an ugly 5.08 ERA this year. He has been an above-average pitcher over the course of his major league career. And he is um, certainly more expensive. Um, you can see to bring him on board, have to get rid of one of the top players on our team or one of the top prospects in the organization. So the cost for... Burroughs is a bit higher, but I think the potential impact of him is a bit higher as well. And we could certainly say the same thing about a reunion with Shane Boz. Uh, this is a route that was uh, recommended since the last episode to us by multiple people. Um, Alkshi and then Wyme943 um, mentioned perhaps including Bertrand Albrighton who was once one of the top prospects in our organization to bring on Boz. Jackhammer Possessor also thinks we should be willing to move on from Al Brighton as well. He's hitting 265 uh, with a 125 WRC plus this year in high A ball, uh, but he's also almost 23 years old. Um, I do still think he could be a useful hitter. Um, I do really like his personality. But he is a guy that um, I am more willing to potentially include in a trade. I am very intrigued by Boz. Uh, he did fine with us a year ago when he had a 381 ERA and a 2 war for us. He's only 1 in 6 with Texas this year, but has put up a 1.4 war. My one concern with Boz is that. Um, the Rangers this offseason gave him a vesting option for next year requiring 180 innings pitched. He is at this point 82 games into the season, pitched 95 innings, so he's on pace to just make it to over 180 innings and trigger that vesting option. I don't think it would be the end of the world to have him back next year at $13.4 million, but I also don't want to put myself in a situation where bringing a pitcher on board to hopefully help push this team back to a winning record and push us back into the playoff spots. And yet I might have some incentive to um, not be pitching him down the stretch um, to avoid 
a vesting option next year. So certainly not a deal breaker by any stretch of the imagination, but just one of those little quirks that uh, I am aware of. And then the fourth and final guy from the Rangers who's on the market is a guy we talked about this past offseason in Ty Madden. And uh, over the course of his career with a 110 ERA plus and an 88 fit minus has been the most accomplished of any of these pitchers. Only a 4-7 and seven record this year, but still has a 3.22 ERA. He's in a really nice position as a rental, uh, making big money this year at $22 million, but we're just past the midway point of the season and he's headed for free agency where he's going to be compensation eligible. He is going to be the most expensive of any of these guys. He does have extreme ground ball tendencies and throws a bit harder than most of the other guys that we talked about, which is positive. We have talked about the clubhouse, um, and he does have that outspoken personality and low leadership, um, which we'd have to counteract a bit if we brought him on board. But although the price for Madden is um, by far going to be the highest, um, you can see straight up, we would just have to give one of the top prospects in our organization to get him for a three-month rental, which I don't think I'm willing to do. But I... Um, Still would consider putting a package together for Madden just because I think he is the best of these guys. And if it's really a win-now year, I think we should consider it. I can't remember whether I showed you the offers for Boz, um, but the offers for Boz were very similar um, to what it would have taken for us to get... Um, Was it Burroughs? Yeah, I think Burroughs was the other guy who was um, kind of mid-range in terms of uh, the potential demands. So my thought is I probably do want to add a pitcher sooner rather than later. At the end of our last episode, we finally did demote Caden Dana, who has a mid-fives ERA for us this year with a 2-5 and five record as a starter. Henry Lalane, we just um, penciled into that number five spot in the rotation, but um, it's conceivable that Lalane may end up back in the bullpen if we're able to pull off a trade for one of the pitchers that we've just mentioned. And I've got an offer together, and we're going to swing for the fences. Um, we will be picking up Jesus Aguiar, who is... Uh, I think calling him a 4A guy might be a little bit generous. He is in AAA with the Rangers organization right now, but not doing particularly well there. 24 years old, um, not really a big-time prospect. But we would get Ty Madden, and they would retain a good chunk of his contract. As we've talked about, I think Madden is the best starting pitcher out there that is a realistic target for us. Um, the outspoken personality class is going to be a concern with some of you, but uh, the derivative moves that we need to make with the way that we have um, positioned this deal, I think will help us overcome some of the potential locker room issues that could um, come from having Madden on board. So there's two main things that we're giving up. Um, the things that aren't primary are Adam Klopfenstein and George Soriano, who are both kind of 4A guys, organizational depth for us. But we are getting rid of our longtime starting first baseman, Tyler Soderstrom, who's been a big part of our team going over the past several years, had some monster years for us, as we talked about. Um, but at this point, he's not even a replacement level player. He has been steadily deteriorating in terms of his offensive production. He doesn't bring much to the table defensively. He's fragile physically, and he's now very unhappy as far as his morale. And we've got a guy in AAA who I think can perform similarly to Soderstrom against right-handed pitching. Um, doesn't have the same type of pop in his bat as Soderstrom, but can help us in other ways. Um, so I feel like since Soderstrom does still have some trade value, we're going to include him. 
I did consider including Bertrand Albrighton, as some of you have suggested, but I went with two other prospects instead. Um, relief pitcher David Velasco, an 11th round pick um, from a couple years ago in the draft. Worried about his control. Um, do like that he throws hard and he's got ground ball tendencies, um, but question um, whether he's going to ever uh, have good enough control to be particularly effective in rookie ball this year. Uh, seven walks in 13 and a third innings. Doesn't give up a ton of hits. Probably getting close to being ready to move up to Class A, but was not going to let him keep this deal from coming through. The other guy, though, is a bit more of a significant prospect for us. David Ramirez, um, the infielder who was a first-round pick for us, 14th overall in 2027. We've been training him more recently to play the corner outfield as well. He's not a dynamic infielder anywhere, but he can play a number of positions now, including the corner outfield spots. But he's hitting just 203 this year in double A ball, his first time at that level with a 62 WRC plus. Looking at his profile, best case scenario, if he completely develops, he's a slightly above average offensive player. With his defensive versatility and the high work ethic and the fact he'd be making the major league minimum for three years, there's certainly some value with him if he fully develops. But I like Al Brighton and his personality a little bit better. And I think that Al Brighton, although that he's got a long way to go to develop his power, um, is a little bit better of an overall prospect than Ramirez, which is why for the time being, we'll keep Al Brighton on board. It's not inconceivable to me that over the next uh, few weeks, Al Brighton could be heading somewhere else as well. So it's certainly not cheap for a rental of time add in, um, giving up Soderstrom, Ramirez, and Velasco, as I mentioned, our starting first baseman, and two good, solid prospects who certainly have the potential to be useful major leaguers, albeit probably not stars. But we are going, we'll also get a small amount of cash in return, about 400000 So it's not going to use up a ton of our money, which will enhance our flexibility as we get closer to the trade deadline. We're going to go ahead and complete that deal. I don't think the fans are going to be happy that Soderstrom is gone. But um, as I talked about, I think that um, getting him out of the clubhouse at this point, given that he's very unhappy, and he's been below replacement level this year in getting some value for him with a guy who that we think can um, really provide a big boost to our pitching staff is um, hopefully going to help us. Fans not happy with that as we expected. Um, but the move that we're going to make um, with this is to bring up Jared Kelnick. Um, and as I mentioned, he doesn't have the same type of home run power as Soderstrom against righties, but he's actually a little better in terms of his contact, his gap power, and his eye. So I think he can certainly do similar offensively to what Soderstrom has done for us this year. He's a respectable defensive outfielder, but he also gives us that captain personality. And since he would be plugging into the lineup against right-hand pitching, um, That'll ensure that we've got a captain in the starting lineup um, against both righties and lefties. And hopefully bringing Kelnick on board will help the clubhouse in general and perhaps offset a little bit the outspoken nature of our uh, new pitcher, Mr. Madden. And to make room for Madden on the team, um, we're actually going to um, release Jose Acuna, our Rule 5 draft pick who stuck with us from last year. We tried including him in the trade. There's just really no trade value with him, uh, so we're just going to send him back to the Mets. Desperately, we're trying to get some kind of value from him, but uh, haven't been able to. He's been respectable with a 4.23 ERA over 27 and two-thirds innings, but... Um, He's kind of the odd man out when I think about um, this pitching staff at this point. 
So with the addition of Madden, uh, we're going to slot him in as our number three starter behind Ferris and Burns. Uh, and then that's going to move Lelaine back into a relief role for us where he's been pretty effective this year. Uh, Lineup-wise, uh, Kelnick is going to take over for Soderstrom. And we're actually going to move Kelnick to third in the lineup against right-handed pitching. Uh, kind of scary that... Um, the three hole in the lineup is someone that we're just bringing up from AAA, but Chase DeLauder had been in that spot and he has not been hitting much this year. 258 average, only an 86 WRC plus. So we're going to drop him down to sixth in the batting order. And we are still, uh, for those who are wondering, Jake Ortega is going to be used extensively, um, filling in for Kelnick in left field. Lara in center field, and more often than anyone, DeLauder at DH every other day. Uh, so Ortega, although he's only officially in the starting lineup against left-handed pitching, is going to continue um, playing quite consistently for us, given that uh, he is having one of the better offensive seasons of any player on our team right now. So hopefully... Uh, the addition of Kelnick will help in the clubhouse. Uh, the addition of Madden will help the rotation. And hopefully the swap of Kelnick for Soderstrom in the lineup will ultimately result in a little more offense for us. Um, again, it's hard to imagine that Kelnick's going to be worse offensively than um, Soderstrom had been. And with that, uh, we've got a... Nine game homestand uh, before we get to the draft to see how this uh, somewhat revamped roster does. Uh, we've got three against the White Sox, three in the division against the Mariners, and then three against the Giants uh, before we will get to draft day on the 11th. Although uh, technically we might not play that final game before the uh, draft has begun. Forget how the timing of that works out, but. Uh, Hopefully we can win more than we lose over this homestand and feel that uh, maybe we're starting to turn the ship around a little bit here in this 2032 season, which, uh, as we've talked about, is kind of a must-win year for our Oakland A's. And Colt Keith uh, did just reach out asking for an extension again. Uh, says he's looking for eight years at close to $25 million a year, so not quite sure if that's a number that we're going to be able to achieve or not for him. Uh, so probably I'm inclined to let him hit free agency or really engage in discussions once we get to the offseason and know what this team is going to look like a little bit more given that he's fragile physically as good as he's been uh, i don't see any need to rush into a close to 200 million dollar commitment for the oakland days with a guy who's already in his 30s we did win three straight uh, to start off the homestand against the white Sox, including a couple of one run wins in extra innings. Uh, one of our owner goals this year is to uh, improve our performance in extra inning games. Uh, so the fact that we've won uh, two extra inning games in the last three days is probably a slight positive for us in terms of uh, ensuring that hopefully we can uh, keep our job when all is uh, said and done with this 2032 season. And things have gone really well on the field for our A's, so feeling a little more comfortable with the decision we made to at least not be sellers initially. And I was always, as I've said in the comments and I've said over the years, and you've seen, most importantly, for those of you who have watched me over the years, if uh, the team is close to contention anywhere on the periphery of the wild card race, I'm generally much more inclined to be a buyer than a seller. And uh, that inclination seems to be working out, at least over the very short term here. We swept our series against Seattle, um, and we've taken one of the first two against San Francisco. So it's a 7 and one home stand as we head into the rubber game against the Giants. Uh, but that better play has finally gotten our record back to 500 at 45 and 45. Uh, taking a look at the standings, we've moved up to third in the division, 13 and a half behind uh, the Astros, 
Uh, nobody on the leaderboard for us among the top performers in the American League. But as we talked about at the end of the last episode, um, the Yankees, the Royals, and the Astros were all having incredible seasons. And after that, there wasn't too much going on in the American League, and there was a big battle for the wild card. And with this 7-1 uh, record in our last eight games, we've actually climbed into the final wild card spot, even though we're only 500. Three games behind both the Rays and the Angels for the first two spots. But we're two and a half up on the Rangers and the Twins. Um, so we were close to a wild card spot uh, at the start of July and uh, just... A week and a half into the month, um, we find ourselves comfortably-ish in that wild card spot with a two and a half game lead, even though we're only 500 on the year. Uh, we will look at the very early returns of uh, what Mr. Madden did for us in his first start, uh, and he got the W, six and a third innings, only four hits, one walk, eight strikeouts, um, so a nice performance for him in his Oakland debut uh, several days ago. One negative piece of news that we just got before we turn our attention to the draft is that our uh, center fielder Luis Lara torn quad going to be out for four weeks. Uh, he's having a much more difficult year offensively this season than he has over the last few years. Fragile physically, um, but certainly with Lara being out, that will ensure that the Excellent young center fielder, Jake Ortega, is uh, in the lineup every day going forward for the next month against uh, both right-handed and left-handed pitching. So not optimal that we're without our center fielder, but with uh, Ortega on board, although we'll lose a little bit defensively, uh, we'll probably be getting more offensive production going forward. And while we'll be looking for... Uh, a replacement on the 26-man roster for Lara in short order. Uh, we'll be doing that offline because uh, right now, as I noted at the top of the episode, the uh, last thing we wanted to accomplish as we get back in the saddle here with the Oakland A's was uh, preparing for our 22nd pick in this 2032 draft. And as we talked about in the previous episode, uh, the mock draft has some interesting names out there. Um, a couple that were very familiar to us um, were Greg Cuff, a guy that uh, we looked at in the draft three years ago. Uh, we didn't end up signing him. He ended up getting drafted um, by the Pirates, 10th overall. Didn't sign with them, so he has been in Ohio State for the last three years. Uh, pretty productive player. Looks like he can still have absolutely incredible home run power, and he's not too far off major league quality there right now. He is uh, projected to go 16th overall, so unlikely that he will be available for us with the 22nd pick. Uh, but a guy that may be available for us is Amari Raphael, who we also looked at in that same draft. And he had been projected to go 24th uh, just a week and a half ago. And you can see now he's projected to go 32nd. So I think there's a chance that we, we uh, at least get to think about Amari Raphael. He is a guy who went 26th overall three years ago, um, didn't end up signing with the Rockies, was a high school pitcher. He ended up going to Division Three Piedmont College, um, so I don't love the fact that he's faced a poor competition level over the last three years. Perhaps it's a bit of a tell that as good as uh, he looked in terms of his ceiling coming out of high school, he ended up going to a D3 school rather than a D1 school. But his stuff is not far off major league quality now, and his movement isn't too far behind. Uh, the issue with him, as it often is with young pitchers, is the control and keeping the ball in the ballpark. And he's got a lot of work to do on both of those fronts. The 21-year-old throws in the mid to high 90s, um, a potential four or five pitch arsenal. Basically has four major league-ish pitches at this point, although the splitter needs a little more work. If that changeup happens to develop, um, he's got a five-pitch arsenal, 
above average stamina, not great at holding on runners. Um, he's been solid at D3 Piedmont. And certainly for a 22nd pick, um, a college pitcher who's a little further along in terms of his development and has certainly a higher floor than most high school pitchers would be something interesting for us to think about. And it seems conceivable to me that uh, Raphael may be an option for us at number 22. So we'll be keeping an eye on both Cuff and Raphael as to either one of them drops to us at number 22. Otherwise, though, we're going to get the draft started and find out uh, exactly what our options are. And taking a look at the draft log, uh, Greg Cuff ended up going fourth overall, um, so he will certainly not be an option for us, but Omari Raphael uh, will be an option for us as he has not been taken yet. So uh, going to be an interesting decision whether we may look to uh, pick a guy who was picked 26th three years ago coming out of high school, 22nd overall in this uh, 2032 draft. But before we get into the uh, pitchers who are available, uh, we'll take a look at some of the top position player prospects. Uh, heavily weighted, at least in terms of the highest potential towards high school players, as is often the case. Uh, right fielder Chris Derrick uh, certainly looks like an interesting prospect. If he reaches his full potential to contact, home run power and eye are all above average. He is a uh, corner outfielder. Uh, it's six six. He could probably play first base. His range and error ratings are pretty dismal, uh, but just about anybody, especially at that height, can function as a first baseman. Uh, certainly a potentially very interesting bat who's also not looking for a ton of money, although he's got a commitment to go play in college at Arkansas. Another right fielder, Ted Kruger, uh, left-handed hitter, uh, another guy with above average contact and well above average power if he completely develops. He's got better gap power, uh, not quite the eye as the five-star prospect, and another guy who's kind of a corner outfielder at 6'3". He could also play first base, but uh, his range is actually even a little worse than uh, Derek's was, and first baseman Phil Lemon an 18-year-old, uh, pretty well-balanced prospect with good power, not much speed, not much from him defensively. Uh, there's also a number of four-star potential prospects. I'll uh, highlight the ones that I view as the most interesting for you rather than, ah, I'll go through them all. You've been waiting a week for an episode for me. It's only going to take an extra couple of minutes to show you everybody quickly. Left fielder, uh, Robbie Brerley, another pretty well-balanced prospect, a corner outfielder, a uh, few negative personality traits, and uh, impossible to sign, allegedly, as he's committed to Lehigh. Jorge Cobos, a third baseman, a really good contact hitter, um, potentially decent power, uh, has a third base or first baseman's tight profile uh, with his defensive abilities. Interesting prospect, probably not who we'll end up going with. Joe Harmon, center fielder, pretty well-balanced bat, pretty decent range, has more speed than a lot of the guys that we've looked at, uh, high adaptability and work ethic. To me, he's probably one of the more interesting hitting prospects, uh, looking for just under slot, committed to LSU, um, Given that at least he brings something to the table defensively, Mayor Harmon, to me, um, is certainly more interesting than Brerley or Kobos. Um, you know, I'd kind of have him up with Derek Kruger and Lemon as guys that I might consider. Joe Herrink, a right fielder, uh, good home run power, a lot of negative personality traits, probably not the direction I would go. Omari Okariki. Right fielder, uh, another guy with a pretty well-balanced bat. If everything develops, um, could be above average at everything. Got a lot to do in terms of his ability to draw walks. Not much speed. Looks like a corner outfielder profile. Fidel Salazar. 
Uh, pretty decent infield rating, 65 everywhere. And uh, potentially pretty interesting contact hitter with a little bit of pop in his bat. He's not going to walk much, but uh, defensively a well above average defensive infielder who can probably play just about anywhere in the infield, who's a pretty good contact hitter, uh, likely deserves some attention. Alavi Simone. Another fairly well-balanced bat, decent home run power. Uh, he's listed as a second baseman. He could play first or third if you needed him to. Probably not a guy you want in the outfield, though. And then uh, the last couple of four-star prospects are... Uh, oh, and then I guess I'll look at Josh Ament, even though he's a... Three and a half star prospect because he is a college guy. Um, another decently balanced bat. He's got a gun in the outfield. Jesse Barfield esque, Roberto Clemente esque, depending on what generation you're from. Brooks Wimster, 18 year old out of Canada, facing that poor competition up there. Although uh, I'm thinking about a D3 pitcher who's been facing poor competition, so I can't get on the Canadian high school baseball system all that much. Uh, potentially really interesting power, not much defensively, probably not the direction we'd go. Bobby Vermillion, 18 year old center fielder, looks like an incredibly versatile. Uh, defensive player off the charts power and eye potential really good gap power decent speed uh, question is just whether he's going to actually be able to hit the ball frequently enough and not have an insane number of strikeouts um, but a pretty versatile defensive player who can uh in theory, play anywhere except for catcher, although I don't think you'd feel great about him at shortstop, third, or center field, and probably honestly wouldn't even love him at second base. But certainly has some uh, areas where he can be exceptional. And then last of the four-star everyday prospects, Matt Spade Jr., second baseman, uh, another guy with a pretty well-balanced bat, but he's uh, got some work to do as far as his plate discipline. Not that great defensively, not that smart. Went uh, to Del Barton in Morristown, New Jersey, following in uh, Anthony Volpe's footsteps, I believe. And we've got uh, five, or actually it's six pitchers who are Four and a half star potential, so we'll take a look at all of them, um, including our friend Mr. Raphael. Uh, Juan Campos, high school prospect. Uh, stuff we think could be absolutely exceptional if the fastball, the change, and the sinker all develop. A um, lot of positive personality traits. Uh, looks like his movement and control are going to be averages, extreme fly ball tendencies. Probably not the direction I would go with the 22nd pick with a high schooler um, who might end up in the bullpen if uh, all three of those pitches don't develop. Edgar Ferinas is a reliever. That changeup could be a nice second pitch for him, but not a ton of stamina. Uh, I think he could be really interesting. Turkey Foot Valley Area High School in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I don't see myself taking a reliever at number 22. Matt Perry, a 17-year-old starting pitching prospect, uh, could have a, I can't say a potential five-pitch arsenal with how we have that splitter scouted, but could be a three- or four-pitch guy, decent enough stamina, uh, high work ethic, uh, movement on his pitches could be average, and he's pretty far along there. I think his stuff and his control could both be above average. Decent high school prospect at 6'7". Josh Reardon, 
a closer prospect, only 25 stamina. Looks like he could be a really interesting reliever. Uh, doesn't throw a fastball. He's got a curve and a cutter. Uh, so I guess the cutter is a fastball derivative, so that's fine. Um, but I don't see us going with a closer prospect at 22 overall. Ben Soffer, uh, high school prospect out of Brockton, Mass. Uh, oof. He's going to need a change-up and a splitter to develop just to have a three-pitch arsenal at the major league level. And his stuff has got a lot of work to do. Um, also looking for pretty big money. Probably not a direction that we would go before we finish up uh, taking a final look at Raphael. Um, there are a number of four-star prospects that I'll go through quickly. Jeff Morrison, uh, high school starter, another guy whose stuff is a potential issue. Probably not the direction I would go. Alejandro Medina, more versatile potential arsenal here, like his durability. None of the pitches are going to be exceptional, but still think that the ultimate combination could be above average stuff, movement, and control. Throws only in the low 90s. Jonathan Luff, an 18-year-old, another guy that's a borderline starter as far as his arsenal. Um, we don't think that slider, which would be his third pitch, is going to be quite average major league quality. Arturo Ibars, 18-year-old out of Water Hill, Tennessee, uh, going to be reliant on that sinker developing to get a three-pitch arsenal and he's also only got 35 stamina 30 holding runners although he's listed as a starter probably not a gamble we'd take at 22 overall sam hale don't like some of those personality traits and uh his third and fourth pitches we project to both be very borderline ben fagan another guy you know Maybe a three-pitch arsenal if that fork ball develops. Jonathan Brown. Could have a four-pitch arsenal, but he's got a lot of work to do on his change, his curve, and his sinker. But 17 years old, throws in the mid to high 90s with ground ball tendencies. Um, stuff could be off the charts, and movement and control could both be above average. Um, allegedly is impossible to sign, though, as he's uh, interested in going to Delaware, where he could visit Wilmington, or perhaps a screen door factory. Let me know in the comments if you know where that reference is from. Josh Bess, uh, final high school starting pitching prospect uh another guy pretty marginal in terms of his arsenal do like the high leadership adaptability and work ethic the extreme ground ball tendencies but he's got a lot of work to do as most high school pitchers do to develop a uh, major league quality arsenal so that leaves us uh, with the final guy to talk about being amari Raphael. um still see him having four and a half star potential don't love the fact that we kind of only see him as a half a star today. Um, still got a lot of work to do on his control and keeping the ball in the park, as we've talked about. But he does have, compared to most of the other pitchers we've talked about, uh, the potential for a higher quality and more expansive arsenal of four or five pitches if he uh, does completely develop. Not great at holding on runners, decent stamina, high adaptability. Don't love the poor competition level that he's faced, uh, but his stuff and his movement aren't far off major league quality. It's really going to be about uh, getting the ball over the plate and then keeping the ball in the park when he does get it over the plate, which are admittedly very important things uh, for a pitcher to have mastered. And he certainly hasn't mastered either at this point, but uh, he throws in the mid to high 90s. Uh, there's definitely some things to like about Mr. Raphael. So if you have thoughts on uh, which direction we should potentially go with this 22nd pick in the draft, I uh, would love to hear them in the comment section down below. Uh, the good news, as we've talked about, is that out of our break, uh, 
our Oakland A's are playing much better, and uh, we've turned things around over this past week and a half, and if the uh, season were over today, our A's would be back in the playoffs for the third time in, fourth years, uh, in four years. So given the uh, start that we've had to the season, the fact that we can say that right now, uh, definitely recommend some progress. Going to really feel like we have to get this team into the playoffs now, having traded away Soderstrom as well as two solid prospects. Uh, the hope is that we get some uh, good performances from Ty Madden going forward. I would certainly love another 10 or so starts, uh, similar to the one that he gave us in his first outing in an Oakland A's uniform at home. And with that, we will call it an episode. Uh, if you've got thoughts on what we should do in the draft, I would love to hear them between now and next time. And until then, thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day.